Chapter 12, Boxing Matches, 1973. The guards came by one afternoon and proposed setting up boxing matches between MA and NF members every Saturday night. The way it would work was we would go to the MA tier to box one week and the next week they would come over to our tier. The guards would stand on opposite ends of the tier with three cells between forming a ring. Whoever's tier we were on, members would challenge the other gang member to box. Nobody could decline a challenge. It was unacceptable. Saturday night boxing was approved by Peanut and Ninny and lasted about three weekends. That's when Bobble came back from Chino. When Bobble saw what was going on, he lost his cool and the boxing matches came to a screeching halt. Any kind of games between two adverse factions were taboo to the Nuestra Familia. Bobble had an idea of his own. His plan was that the next time the MA came to our tier, the NF brother that was boxing would force the MA opponent against the bars so he could be stabbed. This plot was foiled when staff caught wind of it and cells were searched for weapons. In the meantime, Nini had lost his rank and Peanut was under investigation for approving the boxing activity without first checking with anyone in the higher ranks. Bobble also picked up on the tension between Larry and Peanut and knew about the coup against Larry. Bobble had another investigation going on without my knowledge. It was against my cousin Boyle and was from an incident that happened years before. Bobble called me aside and asked my opinion about it and wanted to know how I felt about Boyle being targeted to be hit. I told Bobble that if the situation merited that action, then I would go along with it. The incident he was referring to happened in the TV room one night in Sea Wing back in the 70s at DVI. Bozo was an NF from San Jose. He and Boyle were watching TV that night when out of nowhere, an unknown black guy came in and hit Bozo on the side of the head from behind. <laughs> Binged him upside his fucking head. The attack was a distraction so that the MA by the name of Duke from Hazard could start stabbing Bozo in the chest and back. Bozo was bleeding profusely and the surprise attack had overwhelmed him. He couldn't even mount a defense. Instead of helping him, Boyle panicked and ran off to hide, showing his cowardice. He was under the bench while his friend lay mortally wounded, breathing his last breath. When I found out the facts of why Boyle was under scrutiny, I told Bobo I would go by the book if I was facing the same situation. I asked Bobo if I could make the hit myself. He reminded me that I had just been sentenced for murder and my plate was already full. I told him I had a plan for the hit. There would be four guys on the tier in the morning when the tier tenders were out for cleaning. One of the four could be Boyle. The other three were me, Albert, and Snake. I'd make the hit while the others looked out. Again, Bobo told me to stay out of it and not get involved. He said to tell Albert and Snake to make the hit instead and for me to pass that order along. When I told them about it, they didn't respond. When I took the knives to Albert and Snake, they refused to complete the order. When I got back to Bobo and told him what had happened, he said not to worry about it. He had a backup plan. He decided to send Peanut and Oso as sort of a discipline for the boxing fiasco. They were also to be demoted for their bad choice. I volunteered yet again to do the hit. My youthful enthusiasm and ambition rising to the surface. I knew I could do it, but I wasn't looking down the road and seeing the bigger picture. I just wanted to be part of the action and prove myself to Bobo and the organization. Bobo did, however, allow me to set the operation up, telling the hitters what and how it was going to go down. Bobo confided in me that two other hits were going to happen the same day around the same time. Besides Boyle, there was Fat Mike and Manny from Salinas. Fat Mike had run away from his responsibility with the hits on Bullwinkle and Diamond at Susanville. Manny would face his punishment for running away while another brother, Weddle, was attacked and died from his wounds. The next morning began normally. It was just another day as if everybody else was concerned. We had cornmeal mush and French toast. You would never have known what was about to unfold. Bobble told me that between 9.30 and 10, the plan would kick into action. The mainline population was released to yard and everyone outside. Everyone went outside as usual. Fat Mike was walking laps with the other two NF members talking about nothing in particular. 
it was sunny and clear, about 70 degrees, a perfect day. Fat Mike didn't know he had eaten his last breakfast. The two NFs with Fat Mike were leading him down toward Dead Man's Alley like a lamb to slaughter. When they got near the spot, they made sure no staff were in eye shot and sort of drifted in that direction. Suddenly, they pulled out their blades and pounced on Fat Mike. One blade caught him in the juggler, which caused warm blood to start pumping out in rhythm with his heartbeat. The other brother stabbed him in the upper torso. It was swiftly and deadly. In a matter of seconds, Fat Mike was no more, bleeding out and laying in his own pool of blood. Staff saw the two assailants fleeing the scene, covered in blood. The alarm sounded and they were quickly busted. When the alarm sounded from Fat Mike's demise, that was the signal for the hit on Lil Manny to begin. He was forced into a cell and stabbed about 40 times. The assailants stuffed him under his bunk and proceeded to wash themselves off in his sink. They changed clothes and casually left like nothing had happened. Then they drank coffee and waited for the next unlock. When they didn't expect, what they didn't expect was for little Manny to somehow muster up enough strength to stagger out of his cell and manage to get into the tier before collapsing. He did in fact survive his wounds. When the second alarm sounded for the hit on little Manny, it meant that Boyle was next. I was near the front of the tier on the punching bag, keeping point. I was also acting as cover to block what was going on from the view of the staff. Boyle was hit before he knew what was happening. He got it multiple times in the chest, head, and back. At one point, he was stabbed in the eye and liquid squirted out. Another blade sliced into his spinal cord, which caused his limbs to collapse beneath him. His wounds totaled in excess of 60 holes. That was the third and final alarm. Emergency lockdown followed. I had to walk past Boyle to get to my cell. He was laying there crying, his eyeball hanging out of its socket in the pool of blood. He was asking me to help. I just looked down at him and said a word, didn't say a word, knowing I couldn't do anything. I just shook my head and kept walking. I heard later that he survived the wounds, but lost his right eye and walks with a cane and a limp. The three hits that day sounded the alarm to the administration that the Nuestra Familia was cleaning their own house and putting things in order. This also alerted other prison administrations of possible similar activities. Before the dust had settled, three of our own had been hit by our own brothers, and we were on total lockdown pending investigation of the three incidents. By the afternoon, it was extremely quiet in the building and on the tier. Everybody was in shock at what had happened. I had a restless sleep that night. Boyle was my cousin, after all, but he had screwed up, losing respect with the familia. The next morning, both Albert and Snake locked it up went into protective custody for fear of what would happen to them for refusing to hit Boyle. They knew they were in danger. That was the first protective custody move ever at DVI. Over the next two weeks, I had questions on my mind that needed resolving. I asked Bobble to help me understand particularly why we, the NF, were at war with the MA. Why was Mexican fighting Mexican? I wasn't in favor of this. From my Brown Beret days was, was in history, I felt that warring against one another seemed wrong and senseless. I knew if somebody could tell me, it would be Babo. So he started telling me how it all started, how the MA came into existence and how the war began. It was in the 1950s that the MA came about. They started as a prison gang. They were dealing drugs, prostituting homosexuals. <laughs> God damn gambling, and other money-making vices. They were also preying on weaker inmates. Then sometime in the, in the 60s, one Sunday morning, five individuals were sitting around pondering how they could make it better among the Mexican people. These guys had compassion for the Mexican inmates and didn't like the way they were being treated by the inmate. There have been several little skirmishes between both sides, but nothing serious. At that time, the NF and the MA were just sort of getting along, tolerating one another. Cheyenne, a leader of the MA, saw that the two gangs were beginning to bump heads and that communications were breaking down. He was trying to keep the peace. Baba went on to tell, tell me how the actual war broke out between the gangs. 
It was at San Quentin over some shoes. An NF member named Hector Mad Dog from San Jose had a brown pair of Romero's. This was no ordinary pair of shoes. Hector had put a lot of work into them. Top of the line Romero's are considered prime goods, especially brown ones. And Hector was looking to sell them for canteen items. Meanwhile, there was this MA member named Mosco Fly who showed some interest in the shoes and asked Hector if he could check them out for a few days. What Hector didn't know was that Mosco had a reputation for ripping guys off. He was about six foot two, a hefty 350 pounds, and he never intended to pay Hector. After a couple days, Hector was going on a visit and jammed Mosco, telling him either he wanted the money or his shoes. Mosco informed Hector that it wasn't going to happen. You're burnt. <laughs> you ain't got shit coming, punk. God damn, he just took homie shoes like that, man. That's fucked up. Hector knew he had a problem at this point. He knew he would have to retaliate, not, not only against Mosco, but against the Emmett for disrespecting him by stealing his shoes. The Emmett already had their own plans. That afternoon, they drew first blood by hitting Hector and the two other NF members on the upper yard. They then pushed their luck by hitting four other NF members on the lower yard, all at the same time. <laughs> Damn. The prison was in chaos, alarms going off all over the place. Nobody was critically injured, but San Quentin was on lockdown for investigation into the incidents. They later decided to remove all the NF from San Quentin and basically gave it to the Emmy. When Bobo became general, he declared war on them and stated that there would never be peace because those vicious attacks on the NF that day. And that's how the war started over a pair of shoes. Meanwhile, I continued my schooling from some of the older guys like Nanny, Shark, and Peanut. I was anxious and motivated to learn all I could. I also knew the more I learned, the more responsibility I would inherit. I was getting in deep, but it was what I lived for. The NF was pretty much dominating the whole. More and more members were showing up there, especially after hits. Because there were so many of us, there was a need to spread the leaders out throughout the building in order to control things the most efficient way. There were other changes going on in the NF at the same time. Bobo promoted Larry to captain to pick up where Peanut left off. Larry had held his position even while dealing with adversary adversity from Peanut, so it was a good promotion. Peanut would never again hold rank in the Familia. He lacked leadership skills and had sunk his own boat. Another change made was to promote me to lieutenant, my first rank ever. It was an unpopular choice for many other members. There was a little animosity because some of the guys didn't know me at all. Didn't know me at all. Some were jealous and thought Bobo was showing me favoritism. As seventh lieutenant, I was assigned to the first tier and in charge of the punishment and or initiation. I think I was promoted because of my eagerness to learn about the organization and its inner workings. Bobo saw me, Bobo saw in me what others didn't. He saw my potential as a leader and nobody questioned his actions. He saw that I was ready to move up in the ranks and leave the nest. He thought I was ready to take the responsibility of commanding soldiers on my own, to have guys under me. That meant I would have to be relocated to another tier without divulging the reason to staff. I didn't really want to move. I had made friends and some of those guys helped me to get to where I was. Bobo believed in me. He knew I could do it and I wasn't going to let him down. Some of the members knew what was going on and knew I had taken my job seriously. They weren't sure whether they should fear me or appreciate and trust me. Only time would tell and they would get their answers.